top 10 weird World War II tanks. Once again, with coursework deadlines closing in on me, I find myself procrastinating and uh, doing everything I can not to actually do my coursework. So I decided to make this list. I hope you find the list enjoyable. All the tanks we will talk about today actually did exist and were built. No prototypes or blueprint tanks are on the list. While tanks such as, you know, the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rat, a German super tank that would redefine the term landship, weighing in at over 1,000 tons. I mean, it's a fun tank to talk about, but it didn't actually exist. I mean, it was just on paper. The video is going to be split up into two parts because, frankly, I haven't actually finished my research on the other five tanks and the bonus one yet. So, without further ado, let's get started. Number 10. The Sturmtiger. Or if you're German, the Sturmtiger. I probably still butchered that. It's a German tank. Well, not really a tank. It's more of a... So, I think the official title is Self-Propelled Artillery Piece. Using a system based off a naval mine launcher to propel shells that weighed almost 380 kilograms, it was designed to take on entrenched and fortified positions. It could only carry 13 rounds, and 14 rounds really, if it had one loaded in the main barrel of the gun, but this wasn't really advised for travelling. The rounds of the Sturmtiger were so heavy that it required a crane to load the shells in from outside into the storage areas of the tank you know, for storage. And then also using the same crane to load shells from the internal storage areas into the main gun so it could actually fire. 380 kilograms is not exactly an easy object to move just by hand alone. Along the top of the roof of the Sturmtiger, the top metal plates could be removed so that the crane could access the internal areas to help move the shells around on the inside. The Sturmtiger used a Tiger 1 base, which it was slightly shortened though. Not exactly as long as the Tiger one, just slightly stubbier because it didn't have to accommodate all the extra room for the actual gun. The gun was rather stubby and it was mounted all the way in the front, so they could afford to make this tank slightly shorter. The front alarm was 150mm thick, which is, that's a lot for a World War II tank. And not only that, but it was sloped for increased effectiveness, bringing up the effective armour thickness to 220mm. At the time the Sturmtiger was deployed, it would have been almost impossible to penetrate the frontal armour with what the Allies were using. But there's a lot more to tank warfare than who has the biggest bit of armour on the front, who has the biggest gun. Just because you have a tank that, you know, looks very good on paperwork, you know, has a very good gun, has very good armour, doesn't mean you're going to do better against other tanks. There's a lot more when it comes to tank warfare than just the armour thickness. The Sturmtiger had a host of problems around it. One of the problems with the Sturmtiger is that it entered late service in 1944. At this time, Germany was on the back foot on losing ground on both the Eastern and the Western Front. Therefore, it didn't have time to be used for its original purpose of removing entrenched slash fortified positions. There is a report though that one Sturmtiger took out multiple Shermans with one shell, but I don't know about the feasibility of that report. Logistics was a problem that plagued the tank, as it used custom shells, which was very difficult to organise resupply. Not only this, but at this point in the war, fuel was a dwindling resource for Germany. Sturmtigers were generally abandoned when they ran out of ammunition or fuel. A total of 19 Sturmtigers were ever made, and currently four of them are in museums for display around the world. Number 9. The KV-7, and also the KV-7-2. Also called Object 227, which kind of reminds me of the famous order by Stalin, you know, no order number 227, not one step back. Anyway, the KV-7 was a kind of experiment by the Russians into multi barrel tanks. The KV-7 and KV-7-2 were built on a KV-1 base. The turret was a new custom design, designed to hold three cannons inside it, which came at the sacrifice of it being non-rotating. The main cannon was a standard KV-1 gun, 76mm. On either side of the main gun were two smaller ones, each one 45mm. The other variant of the KV-7, the KV-7-2, was of a similar design, but the key difference is instead of having three guns, it only had two. And they were both 76mm, you know, both the same standard gun of a KV-1. Both of these prototypes though were taken apart and used for other purposes, after they were tested. I can't find any citations for this particular phrase, but it is said Stalin said something along the lines of, why do I need three guns, best to install one, or something along those lines. Both tanks were not looked on favourably by the Russians, as they kind of wanted a tank that could also fight other tanks effectively. The key downside of both these tanks was that they only had 15 degrees of traversal on the guns. 
which is a fancy way of saying they're not very good at turning left or right. See, because the turret was fixed facing forward, the guns could rotate inside that turret just a little bit left and right, but it was not that much. Another reason why the tank may have also been a failure is that the Russians were looking into developing a tank that could take on fortified positions, and low caliber cannons were not going to cut it. This led to kind of the development of the SU-152 with its massive, single, large caliber gun. It was very good at taking on fortified positions. Number 8. The BT-42 A Finnish tank which took inspiration from many other tanks during the time period. We're going to talk about the different elements that went in for this tank, because it's a mixed bag of Frankenstein's parts. The base of the tank was a Russian BT-7, and these were captured tanks from the enemy. The base though of the BT-7 was an American design suspension system called Christine Suspension. I don't know if that's the actual brand, but it's the people that definitely made this suspension. The advantage of this suspension system was that it had the added benefit of not only being actually very good at being a very good suspension system over rough terrain, but also the tracks could actually be removed and allow the vehicle to drive on the road wheels. It was a relatively simple process to switch to driving about tracks and also came with a couple of extra benefits. One of which was a higher speed when driving on roads, and the other one was less wear and tear on the tracks and track links. Interestingly, the tank actually had a steering wheel which was used when driving about the tracks. This is because you couldn't steer anymore by varying the speeds between treads. Normally tanks, you know, if they want to go left, they normally put the brakes on the left tread and increase the power in the right treads, and that will bring them over to the left. But this tank had a really interesting design which allowed the front two road wheels to actually turn left and right, hooked onto the steering wheel, so it basically became a car. The next inspiration is German heat rounds. Heat rounds are designed to ignore sloped armour, which would have been extremely useful versus the Russian T-34s which were known for taking advantage of sloped armour, which is an effect of taking your armour and then sloping it slightly to increase the effectiveness and chance of ricochets and shots not penetrating the tank. Turns out the heat rounds had very little effectiveness. An example of this was a BT-42 landing 18 hits on a T-34 with none of the rounds having any effect, so the heat rounds were a bit of a failure. The fourth inspiration of this Frankenstein-esque tank is the British turret, which was a massive box turret with a whopping 4.5 inch howitzer in there. It was very hard to operate the tank because it only had three people in there. One was the driver, and another one was the gunner, and the loader. And with these massive shells and a very cumbersome firing system, it proved not to be that effective. All of these inspirations that I talked about are just borrowed tech from other countries. The Finns were rather in a pickle when it came to tanks. The base of the tank is just a captured enemy tank. The heat rounds were licensed by the Germans for manufacture. The turret was made in England and supplied by the British. And in the end, the tank didn't do too well. In one conflict, nine BT-42s engaged, only one survived. The BT-42 was eventually written off and replaced in favour of German Panzer IVs and Stugs. Only 18 BT-42s were made, and I think one of them is still in this place somewhere in Finland. Fun fact by the way, the song you've been listening to in the background, which I daren't pronounce because I will butcher it, but I'll put it on screen. It's a traditional Finnish song. When the Finns recaptured the city of, I'm not going to even say this, I'll butcher the pronunciation, but I'll put it on screen as well. It was discovered that the Soviets left radio controlled mines. This song was used to jam the radio signals to the Soviet radio controlled mines. By playing the song on the same frequency of the mines, they could effectively stop the Soviets from detonating them. It said that the song was played for 1,500 times until other equipment was brought in to continue radio jamming instead. 1,500 times multiplied by 150 seconds, which is the average length of the songs that I found on YouTube. That makes 225,000. Divide this by 60 for the minutes, which is 3,750. Divide again by 60, gives us 62 and a half hours. And lastly, divide by 24 for days, which gives us two and a half days of solid music playing by the Finns to jam these mines. Number seven. The Skink Anti-Aircraft Tank. It had four 20mm anti-aircraft guns mounted onto the base of an M4 Sherman tank. The M4 being one of the most iconic tanks of World War II as it was used heavily by the United States. Large numbers were also sold to other countries through Lend-Lease. They produced almost 50,000 Shermans in total. The Sherman was a good flexible platform for testing prototypes, such as the T-34 Calliope. Not to be confused with the T Russian T-34, you can clearly see there's a dash. 
The T-34 Calliope is a standard M4 Sherman but with 60 rocket pods mounted in a frame above the turret. There are many other varieties of the Sherman, such as the Sherman Firefly, which was developed by the British. The British replaced the original gun and put a more powerful gun that would be effective at penetrating enemy tanks. This came at the cost though of the effectiveness to engage infantry. If there was a job that needed doing, the Sherman could do it. You need a recovery vehicle? No problem, take the turret off, put a crane on top of it, you got a recovery vehicle now. Need a bulldozer? Just weld a dozer blade onto the front of the tank, you're good to go. Need something to traverse minefields and clear the way for your units? Just mount a flail on the front of it, it'll be fine. Back to the Skink. It was designed to help counter the Luftwaffe and provide support for ground units. In actuality, the German Air Force, or Luftwaffe, had already lost air superiority in the region of France. With the skies controlled by the Allies, resources did not need to be used in the defence of planes by ground units. Of the three skinks that were made in total, only one of them saw combat, and it was commended for being actually rather good in the role of infantry support. We're going to be entering the realm of speculation now, but I have a few theories why I may not have entered full-time production. From my understanding, the skink would have been able to take much more of a punishment if under direct attack, unlike what was currently in the field such as the M13 and then later in the war the M16, which were both light vehicles with very little protection for the crew. The Skink's additional armour would have been useful if the skies were controlled by the German Air Force and frequent attacks on the ground were to be expected. With large numbers of M16s already in production and in circulation in the armed forces, there may not have been a need for resources to be diverted to something new when the old model worked perfectly fine. The Skink would be offering much more firepower though than the current M16 as it had a quad 20mm barrels compared to M16 which had a quad 50 cows. The stopping power of a 20mm round is much greater than a 50 cal. Another reason why I don't think it actually got into the production phase is that when they were in the planning phase for the tank, they tried to get Hispano cannons, but they couldn't get a supply of them since they were in such high demand for fighter planes. The Skinks were originally designed to be modelled for the Hispano 20mm cannon, and so they got a new gun, which I dare and pronounce I'm going to butcher it, but I'll put it on screen. This new cannon type required a redesign of the turret, and it took time to do this redesign of the turret, which pushed back the date of the possible manufacturing start time. Number 6, the RBT-5. This is a modified Russian BT-7, with a small difference. There's two giant 250 kilogram torpedoes on top of it. Other than these two massive torpedoes and the device to hold them, there's no change to the actual tank. This tank did not get out of the prototype phase. The BT-7 was just a standard light nimble tank which held a crew of three, had a small 45mm calibre gun. I described most of the characteristics already, remember I was talking about the Christine suspension earlier? I couldn't find out too much information about the development and the performance of this tank in trials. The RBT-5 was most likely just an experiment in a way to deal with fortified enemy positions. This is just speculation but I'm assuming that the trials proved that it wasn't really useful enough to be put into mainstream production. Well, that's all I got so far. The rest of the 5 tanks and the bonus one have already been chosen, but feel free to suggest tanks that you think that should be on this list. I might change my mind if they're really interesting. Part 2 should be out fairly shortly, so leave a like if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you want to, and if you subscribe I guess you see part 2 when it comes out. Thanks for watching. Like, comment and subscribe or I'll break your f***ing legs.